So today we're going to start talking about labor demand. Um, so we discussed in the previous weeks, we've been building up a model of labor supply. On Tuesday, um, we looked at how we can use that model of labor supply decisions to kind of explain uh, changing patterns of labor force participation rates over time. Um, we did an example, um, and it, like a, a longer exam question type example um, of, with a housing subsidy. Um, and so now we want to move into the other, discussing the other side of the market, which is the demand side of the labor market. And labor demand is what we call a derived demand. Um, firms are hiring workers because consumers want to purchase the goods and services that those workers are going to help the firm produce. Um, so the demand for workers Okay, so the demand for workers is derived from consumers demand for goods and services. So firms don't say, I want to hire 12 workers. Let's see how much those workers can produce. They say, I think I can sell a certain amount of goods. How many workers do I need to hire to produce that quantity of goods? It's going to depend on two things. It's going to depend on worker productivity. and also the price of the product that is being produced. So the goal of firms is going to be to maximize their profits um, the cost of their inputs and the price of, prices of the goods and services that they're selling um, are going to be determined by markets. And so firms are then going to decide uh, whether they should be producing and um, how much they should be increasing or decrease, decreasing production. Um, and firms are going to be making their decisions um, at the margin. So should we produce you know, one more good, one more... Um, one more good should we hire one more worker. So first we're going to be talking about firm's decisions in the short run, and then we're going to move into discussing firm decisions in the long run. Um, so a firm's short run production function is going to show the relationship between inputs and outputs. So let's assume that there are only two inputs, capital, which we'll denote with a K, and labor, which we're going to denote with an E, because we've already used L for leisure. We don't want to get confused between labor and leisure. Um, and so the E stands for essentially employment hours. And so in the short run, the level of capital is going to be fixed. It's going to be fixed at, we'll say, K bar. So basically in the short run, firms can't change um, the number of machines they have, the number of factories they have, the size of their factories. All they can change is the number of workers. So their total product, or their uh, production function, um, Q is going to be some function of the employment hours and some fixed amount of capital.
And so if we look at the production function, um, total product, or Q, as a function of labor, remember capital is fixed, um, we might see um, a curve that quickly slopes, uh, that's upward sloping, and eventually perhaps downward sloping as we add, um, as we continue adding fixed amounts of, or sorry, more workers to fixed amount of capital. So the total product is the total amount of output produced by each quantity of labor and a fixed amount of capital. The marginal product of labor, um, MP sub E, is the change in the total product, the change in output, divided by the change in employment hours. <coughs> so if we hire one more worker for one more hour, how much is total product going to change? So that marginal product is just the slope of the total product curve. And then the average product of labor, AP sub E, tells us, well, on average, how much is each worker producing. So it's the total output, total product, divided by the number of employment hours. And so the law of diminishing returns tells us that as more units of labor are added to a fixed amount of capital, the marginal product of labor will eventually decline. So it's not necessarily always declining, but eventually it will decline. Um, and so typically we kind of think about marginal product increasing at first as workers, uh, may, as you add more workers, they can maybe develop more specialized roles, um, but eventually we'll see that marginal product decrease when we look at um, our graph of marginal product with um, the number of workers or number of employment hours on the horizontal axis, output on the vertical axis. And so another thing that I want to point out is that if we're looking at the marginal product and average product, there's going to be a very well-defined relationship between marginal product and average product. Um, so the marginal product is going to intersect that average product curve at the maximum of the average product of labor. So if marginal product is higher than the average product, it's going to be pulling the average up. And if the marginal product of each additional worker is lower than the average product, going to be pulling the average down. So I like to think about this in terms of, or I think the example that always resonated the most with me, and perhaps it'll resonate with you all as well, is if you think about your grade in a class, your final grade is going to be some average of your grades on individual assignments. And you can think about each individual assignment you could pass as a marginal grade. So if you have some average in the class, um, so let's say that you have a, um, you know, an 80% average in this class going into the midterm. If you get that midterm grade back, that's your marginal grade, and it is lower than an 80%, that's going to pull your course average down. And if you get your midterm grade back, your marginal grade back, and it's higher than an 80%, it's going to pull your average course grade up. So 
so you always, if you want to know if the average, the average product is increasing or decreasing, you always need to know is, mar is the marginal product higher or lower than the average. If it's higher, it's pulling up the average, and the average is increasing. And if it's lower, it's pulling down the average, and the average is decreasing. Let's do a think pair share. A firm making MP3 players has a production function of the form Q equals E to the one half K to the one half. Assuming the capital stock is set at 1600 units, find the marginal product of labor. Uh, fill in the chart with the average product of labor and the marginal product of labor for 8100, 10,000, 12,100, and 14,400 units of labor. So we want to find the total output, the marginal product of labor, and the average product of labor.
Take about one more minute. Tell me how we find the marginal product of labor. So we want to take the partial derivative of our total product function with respect to labor. Um, but first, we know that the capital stock is set at 1,600 units. So we have e to the 1 half times 1,600 to the 1 half. So q is equal to 40 times e to the 1 half. So that's our total product function. And if we want to find the marginal product of labor, we can just take the partial derivative. So 20 times e to the negative 1 half, or 20 divided by the square root of e. How do we find the average product of labor? We just divide total product by E. So the average product of labor is going to be 40 times E to the 1 half divided by E, which is 40 divided by E to the E to the 1 half, or 40 over the square root of E. So now we can fill in our table. We have an equation for output, for marginal product of labor, and for average product of labor. Um, and so if the number of employment hours hired is zero, then output is going to be zero. And we have no marginal product or average product. Um, at 8,100, we have output of 3,600. Um, labor hours of 10,000, we have output of 4,000, um, at 12,100, 4,400, and at 14,400, 4,800. And so to find the marginal product of labor, um, we have uh, E is equal to 8,100, so 20 divided by the square root of um, 8,100 gives us marginal product of labor of 0.222. Um, and then 40 divided by the square root of E would be 0 0.4444. At 10,000, we get 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. At 12,100, 0 0.1818 and 0.3636. And then 16.1667 and 0.3333. Questions about that problem? Okay, one thing to notice is that we have a decreasing average product of labor and marginal product of labor is below the average product of labor the average down. This is going to be true across all, 
all units of labor. If we look at the equations in the short run here, the marginal product of labor is always going to be less than the average product of labor. So the average product of labor should always be decreasing. So now we want to start thinking about, okay, if we can figure out what a firm's marginal product is, how do they use that information to decide how many workers they should hire? And for that, they're going to need to know the value of the marginal product of labor. So not just how many extra units of the good is one extra employment hour going to produce, but what is the value of that additional product? Um, and so the value of the marginal product of labor, um, in 410, you might have discussed this as the marginal revenue product. That's the same thing, marginal revenue product, value of the marginal product, that's the same idea. We want to take the marginal product and think about how much is that worth to the firm. Um, so the value of the marginal product of labor is just the product price, P, times the marginal product of labor. And the value of the average product of labor is just equal to P times the average product of labor. And because we've just taken the marginal product of labor and the average product of labor and multiplied them by a constant, then we'll have the exact same relationship between the value of the marginal product of labor and the value of the average product of labor, and that they're going to intersect at the maximum value of the average product of labor. Thinking about um, how the firms are going to make their employment decisions now, we want to be comparing the value that's generated by an additional worker hour and the cost of hiring that additional worker hour. So we're comparing the value of the marginal product to the marginal cost of hiring an additional worker, which is just equal to the wage rate. So if the income from an additional unit of labor, so if the value of the marginal product is greater than the cost of an additional unit of labor, which is the wage rate, then the firm should produce more and hire more workers. But if the income from an additional unit of labor is lower than the cost of an additional unit of labor, then the firm should be cutting back production and cutting back the number of workers that they're hiring. And so the optimal number of workers to hire is the number of workers where the value of the marginal product of that last worker is equal to the wage that the firm pays them. And so with perfectly competitive firms, perfectly competitive firms can hire as many workers as they want at the market wage rate of W. So the marginal cost of labor is going to be the wage rate. So essentially they're comparing the marginal benefit and the marginal cost, producing up until the point where marginal benefit OK, 
Okay, so in 410, you learn that firms are profit maximizing. Um, so they're setting their marginal cost equal to their marginal revenue. Um, and marginal revenue is just P, the product price. So how does our, uh, our condition for you know, firms deciding how many workers to hire, how does that relate to profit maximization, this marginal revenue equals marginal cost? Well, we want to think about what is the marginal cost of hiring one more worker. Or sorry, this is the marginal cost Not the marginal cost of hiring one more worker, the marginal cost of producing one more unit of output. I'm going to set the marginal cost of producing one more unit of output equal to the marginal revenue that firms are going to get, which is the product price. Um, and the marginal cost of one more unit of output is the wage that firms are going to pay to workers times one over the marginal product of labor. So if the marginal product of labor is the number of units of output that one additional worker hour produces, then one over the marginal product of labor is the number of hours required to produce one unit of output. So we multiply the number of hours required to produce one unit of output by the hourly cost of labor. And we get that W, the wage rate divided by the marginal product of labor, has to equal the product price or the wage rate has to equal the marginal product of labor times the product price, which is just equal to the value of the marginal product of labor. So firms profit maximizing um, in their production decisions is equivalent to them hiring the profit maximizing number of workers in the labor uh, market. Okay. So let's do a think pair share. A firm making MP3 players has a production function of the form Q equals E to the one half, K to the one half. Assume the capital stock is set at 1,600 units. The hourly wage is $10. The price of each unit of capital is $25. And the price of output is constant at $50 per unit. How much labor should the firm hire in the short run? And how much profit will the firm earn? So if we want to find the quantity of labor the firm should hire in the short run, we first need to find the value of the marginal product. So the value of the marginal product of labor is going to equal to the product price times the marginal product of labor. And the price is 50, and we said that the marginal product of labor this was from the last think pair show, was 20 over the square root of E. So our value of the marginal product of labor is equal to 1,000 over the square root of E. 
And so to find the quantity of labor the firm should hire, we take the value of the marginal product of labor and set that equal to the wage rate. So if the wage rate is 10, we set that equal to the value of the marginal product, 1,000 divided by the square root of E, and we find that E should equal 10,000 hours of labor. So now we need to find profits. And so profits are total revenue minus total costs. And we know that total revenue is equal to price times quantity minus the total cost, which is the cost of labor plus the cost of capital. So wage times the number of employment hours plus the rental rate of capital times the amount of capital. Um, so really we have all the information we need except for quantity. And we know that quantity is equal to uh, 40 times the square root of e, or e to the 1 half. And so if we're hiring 10,000 hours of labor, then the quantity is going to be 4,000. So we get a price of 50 times 4,000 minus that wage rate of 10 times 10,000 plus the rental rate of capital, which is 25, times the 1,600 units of capital that are being used. And so we should get profits of $60,000. So next we want to think about how do we represent the short run uh, labor demand curve for a firm. And so the short run labor demand curve for a firm says holding capital constant, how does the firm's desired level of employment change as the wage rate changes? So a firm maximizes their profits when the value of the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage rate. So that gives us the wage as a function of labor because the value of the marginal product is a function of labor. Um, so the value of the marginal product of labor curve is the short run labor demand curve. As long as the value of the marginal product of labor is less than the value of the average product of labor. Because if wages are higher than the value of the average product of labor, um, that's essentially the same thing as saying that average costs are greater than average revenue, and that would be, mean that profits are less than zero and firms shouldn't be producing. So it's the value of the marginal product of labor curve as long as the value of the marginal product of labor is less than the value of the average product of labor. So if we want to derive the labor demand curve for our firm that makes MP3 players, we know that the value of the marginal product of labor is just 1,000 over the square root of E. And so as long as 1,000 divided by the square root of E is less than the value of the average product of labor, which is equal to 2,000 divided by the square root of E, and thus is always true, um, then the wage is equal to, uh, the short run labor demand curve is uh, wage equal to uh, 1,000 divided by the square root of E. Okay, so if we want to measure how responsive the quantity of um, labor demanded is two changes in these wage rates. We can use the short run elasticity of labor demand. And so the short run elasticity of labor demand is the percentage change in employment in the short run resulting from a 1% change in the wage, all else equal. So percent change short run quantity of labor demanded divided by the percentage change in the wage rate. And this is the same as saying the change in labor in the short run over the quantity of labor demanded 
in the short run over the change in wage divided by the wage rate. Or change in labor over the change in the wage rate times the wage rate over the quantity of labor demanded in the short run. <coughs> so again, this is just one over the slope of the short run labor demand curve times the wage rate divided by the quantity of labor demanded in the short run. And so if the absolute value of that short run elasticity of demand for labor is greater than one, then we say that in the short run, demand for labor is elastic, so very responsive to changes in the wage rate. And if instead it's less than one, then we say that short run demand for labor is inelastic. So quantity of labor demanded does not change very much in response to changes in the wage rate. Sigma? No, sigma's like this, right? Is this a delta? That's a lower, yeah, lowercase delta. And the triangle's uppercase delta, right? Yes. Uh, when you point to a one over the slope of shoulder labor to measure, are you pointing to like the entire Okay, so let's do a think pair share. When the wage decreased by 10%, employment increased by 5%. What is the short run elasticity of labor demand? Is labor demand elastic or inelastic in the short run? Who can tell me what the short run labor demand, elast, el, short run elasticity of labor demand is in this case? Yeah. Negative half. Negative half. So we have employment increased by five, wages decreased by 10. So this is negative 0.5. And is that elastic or inelastic? inelastic? Take the absolute value and see that it's less than one. So we have inelastic labor demand. All right. The next thing I want you to do is go back to the previous example. Um, we just found a labor demand curve for that firm producing MP3 players. For the firm 
producing MP3 players is demand elastic or inelastic at a wage of 10 and employment hours of 10,000. So we've got about three minutes left in class. In those last three minutes, please work on this question. Um, if you don't finish it, please work on it before class on Thursday. We'll start class with this on Thursday. Um, and also, clearest thing, fuzziest thing, any general questions or comments before you leave. And please don't forget to fill out that doodle poll, because I would like to select a time for the makeup class that works for the highest number of students possible. <laughs> 